Hi, everybody. I'm Diane Brady. I'm here with Steve Forbes, who is chairman and editor-in-chief of Forbes Media. Steve, good to see you. Good to be with you, Diane. Thank you. We are talking about Henry Kissinger, former Secretary of State who died at 100 and leaves a mixed legacy in terms of how people are reacting to his death. I want to start with what do you feel is the legacy from where you sit? Uh, Henry Kissinger dealt with the big issues of the time that he was in office and helped reshape the world, the Cold War. His opening to China, people say, well, look at China today. Well, it was not the great power then that it is today. Mm -hmm. The Soviet Union was. How do we win the Cold War? So we made the opening to China and uh, to help uh, uh, defeat, ultimately, the Soviet Union. So we had that strategic sense. Uh, the Vietnam settlement, uh, not very satisfactory, but what did that in was Congress's refusal to provide aid to South Vietnam after those accords were signed. In the Middle East, he laid the groundwork for a rapprochement between I Israel and Egypt, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, bore real fruition. So he reshaped the world. He just didn't follow the paper flow, react to events. He helped shape events. And I think that's what makes him such a formidable figure. And he had an appreciation of history. He knew who Metternich was, mm -hmm. the great Austrian foreign mm -hmm. minister who shaped Europe in the early 1800s. He had an appreciation for Bismarck, although he didn't like his handiwork. He uh, understood what Bismarck was able to do because he had a strategic vision. So in that sense, I think he, being an outsider, literally coming from Germany, yeah. as refugees, as a refugee, he understood America's strengths and also possible shortcomings. That's one of the things that has struck me in, in reading a lot of, um, you know, reflections on his life is, is that appreciation. Let's go back to before the settlement, the early days of the Vietnam War and that conflict, this of where the U.S. was and how this whole sort of um, policy around Southeast Asia came about. Because he's very much seen as an architect for that. Is first of all, is that fair? to see him as one of the key architects for basically getting into Vietnam and how that war progressed? Uh, he and Nixon inherited that war. Yeah. That really began under Nixon's predecessor, Lyndon Johnson. Right. The big mistake they made, uh, Lyndon Johnson and his uh, people, the best and the brightest, was they treated Vietnam as if it was a, like, a traditional conflict, like the Korean War or World War II. They didn't recognize it as a true guerrilla war, which is a very different situation. So when Nixon came in, uh, they, gradually the U.S. Army made a fundamental change in how they prosecuted that war, uh, brought the South Vietnamese more into the combat. Uh, so by 1972, when North Vietnam launched a fierce offensive thinking they could topple South Vietnam, the South Vietnamese won that battle. Mm -hmm. Yes, we had people embedded in there to help out, but they fought and won. So combined with our air power, they beat them back. So in terms of uh, what happened afterwards, if you cut a country off from aid, if you don't give them the assistance they need, you're going to get dire consequences, which is what we're just beginning to see happen in Ukraine. Yep. We're going to continue to provide Ukraine the means with which to resist this invasion. If we don't, we can just look and see what the consequences are. So he did the best he could under the circumstances. And also what gets underappreciated is that the effort in Vietnam, although ending in failure in 1975, in one sense did provide the other Asian nations, and Lee Kuan Yew, who's the father of Singapore, Singapore yeah. uh, was almost uh, in his own way was a Kissingerian figure, mm -hmm. made the point that this enabled Indonesia to get the strength to resist a communist uh, insurrection or communist push. Uh, Singapore, not getting overwhelmed. Other Asian nations gave them time to get the strength so that they could uh, resist uh, the encroachments of China and the Soviet Union. He was a very powerful <clears throat> and, and, and certainly learned figure. I, before we um, move on to sort of how he shaped that role, I, I do want to talk about um, how should you frame Cambodia? Because oftentimes when people look at where they blame Kissinger, they blame him for spreading the Vietnam conflict to Cambodia. Is that a misreading of the history? Yes. 
<laughs> there you go. They, yes. They, they, <laughs> Move on. <laughs> no, How they, so? They, 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 the communists, there was a very serious communist insurrection in Cambodia. Mm-hmm. Cambodia was being used as a base in, uh, against uh, South Vietnam. And again, what happened in Cambodia happened after we left. We didn't create Pol Pot. Yeah. He was a formidable figure beforehand. The Khmer Rouge, And yeah. uh, we weren't in a position to stop him. What ultimately dethroned Pol Pot, amazingly, was China. Uh, Viet, after the war, uh, South, uh, North Vietnam, uh, and then Vietnam, uh, started to uh, get very expansive, uh, became the dominant power in Laos, and also were going after Thailand. The Chinese launched a war in 1979 to stop it. In, in military terms, China got it, uh, so got it beaten very badly. The Vietnamese have been fighting 30 years. That China hadn't fought a war in uh, 20 years since Korea, and they got beaten very badly. But South, uh, the, but, Nor- but North Vietnam got the message, uh, pull back. But one of the things they did do was the North Vietnamese got rid of Pol Pot in Cambodia. Yeah. As, as, as a result, so we That's didn't put true. Pol Pot in, and we we're in no position to uh, pull him out or knock him out. That had to be done locally, and it was. So let's step back. One of the things about Kissinger was he was very much, I hate to use the term thought leader, but certainly um, he was very influential after he left the Secretary of State role, both as an advisor, also as somebody who was in the public domain commenting on geopolitics and such. How how do you feel like he performed in that role relative to other Secretaries of State? Because there's a tendency to just see them like a lot of roles as an extension of whoever the president is at the time and the policy of the administration at the time. Well, the the news coverage of uh, Kissinger's time in office, especially with uh, Richard Nixon, sort of answers that question. People wondered, who was the real president? Who was really running things? Uh, Nixon was keenly interested in uh, foreign policy, so he was the, as uh, George W. Bush would say, the decider. Uh, But uh, Kissinger expanded the role of that office in the way that he conducted his diplomacy, the way he would rush in after the uh, Yom Kippur War, for example, to uh, try to uh, break the deadlock that was in the Middle East, get out of that rut, Mm -hmm. and instead of staying with the policies that clearly were not working. So uh, uh, there's a wonderful cartoon of the period of the time. Uh, Kissinger's getting off the plane. Nixon's uh, behind him, and two people at the bottom are whispering, who's that guy behind Kissinger? <laughs> so, uh, so yes, uh, being a formidable figure, especially when he, uh, Nixon was removed from office and Gerald Ford took over, uh, everyone knew who was running foreign policy. And again, what made Kissinger formidable was his ability to shape public opinion, but more importantly, he had a strategic vision. Now, a criticism can be made is that he underestimated the capacity of the U.S. in the troubled 1970s to recover, Mm -hmm. that he overestimated the uh, resilience of the Soviet Union. Uh, but uh, the other criticisms uh, just just don't uh, amount to any, I don't think, are really fair under the circumstances of the time. I think that understanding of history is something that I've always appreciated with Kissinger, to your point. Let's bring it to the present day, because I know you've been talking about Biden. We can talk about Secretary of State Blinken, who, again, um, is a very different figure in that role. Um, how would you compare very different situations today, but... What are the lessons of Kissinger that you think apply to the current context? Well, Kissinger, I think, could look at the world uh, with a cold eye. Yes, he understood American idealism, the way that uh, our history is shaped in a way no other country's history was shaped. And, uh, but the problem with this crowd today is, is they refuse to recognize the realities of the world today mm. and therefore shape foreign policy come up with a strategy. Now, you don't have to be a Kissinger to come up with a strategy. After World War II, people wondered, would the U.S. go back into isolationism as it did in the 1930s? But uh, the foreign policy is reshaped. One of the secretaries of state at the time, Dean Acheson, entitled his memoirs, At the Creation, Mm -hmm. a whole new uh, role for America was created in those years. But there was a strategy. It can be summed up in one word, containment. 
and, uh, and, and it worked over a 40-year period. But again, the, back then, the U.S. took cognizance of very changed circumstances and adjusted effectively to it. Uh, you compare how the West reacted after the big victory in World War I, threw it all away, led to an even more devastating war that nearly destroyed civilization, uh, with what we did after World War II for all the mistakes. We largely got it right. And the question today is after the Cold War, are we doing post-World War I or post-World War II? And so far this crowd is making avoidable mistakes that I think people are going to look back on after that great victory in the Cold War. How did you throw it away and put us in the position we're in today? I think that's very true. I want to end off with one point because we lost Charlie Munger this week as well at the age of 99 and in many ways also a public figure and it feels like there's a dearth of people that step up into the spotlight and help us make sense of the world and I would put Kissinger and Munger in that category in very different respects obviously one investing Berkshire Hathaway what are you seeing? I mean, in many ways, of course, you're that figure as well. But uh, is there that – who do we have in public life that sort of steps above the fray and in a way brings us intelligence as opposed to more content and more rhetoric? This gets into the intangibles. Uh, Charlie Munger, you felt, had a deep understanding of investing, just as his partner Warren Buffett mm -hmm. does. And so uh, you uh, listen more carefully to what they have to say because they bring a depth of understanding, various layers, you might say. And so in terms of uh, looking at the current crop, maybe one of them will rise up the way Reagan did in the 1980s, saw an opportunity to uh, win the Cold War and pursued it, mm -hmm. and uh, also had the skills, the political skills, to bring it about. It's amazing today, going back to uh, the post-World War II period, when there was a real uh, attempt to create a bipartisan po policy and avoid what happened in the 1930s. The chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee in the Senate, uh, who had been an isolationist before the war, worked very closely with Truman and the Democratic mm -hmm. uh, officials to create a bipartisan policy so that uh, we wouldn't uh, make those mistakes again. But they also went out of their way to explain it to the public. Yeah. And so far, Joe Biden, other than one feeble speech, has never gone before the American people to say, why is Ukraine different? He's never sent his officials out there to say, Ukraine is different from what was done in Afghanistan and Iraq. So people don't say, oh, Ukraine, another hopeless long war. No, he hasn't laid the framework that this is very, very different, just as the leaders in the 1930s didn't make the case that uh, what was happening in Europe was very different from what happened in World War I. World War I left a very bad taste in uh, our mouths yeah. and uh, other, other, other people. So we're not going to make those mistakes again. And so they uh, said, oh, Germany, oh, we're not going to fall in that trap again, go into a needless war. They didn't size up what the situation was. Biden has not enabled the American people to size up Ukraine and amazingly Israel. Very different from what happened in Afghanistan and Iraq. They're failing at the fundamental point of leadership, which is bringing people with you, having them understand what is the strategy. This is why we need to do it for our safety. They failed. Here's to having context and intelligence, and thank you for adding to it. Always enjoy speaking with you, Steve. Thank you, Diane. Appreciate it. Thanks. Fun talking with you. Thank you.